nope, that is not, that is not a fail on you at all. That is a fail on me. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ansible 101, um, your tutorial for today. My name is Luke Sneringer. I will be teaching, instructing, blah, 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 whatever you want to call it. Um, my wife, Megan, is in the back. She is going to be the TA and handling all the logistics for this tutorial. As a note, as she just said, uh, we have gone ahead and built a, uh, an Ubuntu box for everyone here to use for testing as a remote machine. If you have your own box that you would prefer use, that is completely fine. Um, but we've, we've just built one to kind of make things easy, uh, easy on everybody. So that's what's going to be going on there. Um, she will go around and be tapping everyone on the shoulder to get your name and get you your IP address and root password. You're not going to need it for about at least 20 to 30 minutes before we get to the root to our first exercise. So don't worry too much about that. Um, and we will be talking up here. So I'm going to talk about what we're going to be going through. Basically, I've divided the tutorial into two segments, both of which are going to take roughly half the time. The first segment is going to be exposition. It's going to be me up here talking, essentially. I do have some small exercises at various points during this period, um, which you'll be able to do by writing a very small amount, uh, writing a very small playbook, and then running it against the server that Megan is giving you. Um, but this should be very, very quick. I'm, my goal is that this will take about an hour and a half. Uh, it's a little bit goofy because the break time is actually scheduled for 10.15 and not 10.30, which is what I would have expected. So I'm going to try to make it go a little fast. Um, there's also some room for that to bleed over. It's not a big deal if it does. The second half is going to be a project. Um, I have designed a, a project that I'm going to have you guys go through for the second half. I'll be coming around to help people with it as they, uh, I'll be going around to help people with it as they have trouble. Um, what I've, what I've done for that is I've figured out in English what all the steps are that you're going to have to go through to complete the project, and then you're going to just need to take the English steps and translate them into Ansible. By an hour and a half from now, you should have the ability to do that. Um, and if you don't, then I'll be walking around to, to give everyone aid. Uh, during an exposition, we're going to cover these things, and you don't need to know what all, all of them are yet. Uh, playbooks, tasks, roles, templates, handlers, modules, and plugins. We'll go over them in order, and we'll spend about 10 minutes on each. Some will take longer than others. But before we can do that, we need to talk about YAML. YAML is the language that Ansible uses to define pretty much everything. Uh, plugins and more complicated things are written in Python, or in some cases in any programming language. But all of your playbooks, your roles, you know, the, the basic things that you're going to have Ansible do, use YAML. So I'm going to give a very, very brief overview of YAML because I'm assuming that some people might not be familiar with it. Yeah, I thought Megan was asking me something, but she's not. So this is a kind of a, a prerequisite. As it is a fairly simple prerequisite, we'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, YAML is a language. It's, it's a language for just data interchange, like say JSON or XML. It stores machine-readable data in a relatively human-readable format. Um, much like JSON, it contains data types that correspond to common data types in Python, strings, ints, floats, dicts, lists, that, that kind of thing. It does have a few other types, uh, like it does have a date type. We don't care. Um, YAML syntax is also relatively loose. There's several ways to have a list in YAML. There's several ways to have a dictionary in YAML. I'm only going to show you one, which is the one I like, because reasons. Um, more things you need to know. Actually, you don't super need to know this because most YAML parsers don't care, but YAML files are supposed to start with three dashes on the first line, because reasons. I don't know why. Uh, it uses syntactic indenting, much like Python. Um, you use the pyyaml Python package to parse a YAML file or YAML string, um, and Ansible includes pyyaml as a dependency. Uh, YAML primitives, pretty much if you're looking at a YAML file, what you think it is, it probably actually is. If it looks like a number and it's not in quotes, it's a number. If it has a decimal point, it's a float. If it doesn't have a decimal point, it's an int. Um, lists and dictionaries have 
a couple of different syntaxes. We'll look at the one that I'm going to teach. There's a couple other ways to do it. We'll come back to that. Pretty much anything else is a string. Um, if it's a special type, it's really, 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 really obvious because it begins an exclamation mark, exclamation mark, type name. Um, and you can't possibly miss it. We also don't have to deal with those. Lists in YAML, one item per line. Each line begins with a dash, much like if you're trying to write a bulleted list in Markdown or something, and then includes whatever the list element is. Uh, elements can be any well-formed YAML type, so scalars, sticks, lists, whatever. Uh, you can also use square brackets, which make it look just like a Python list, um, but I'm not going to. So this is what a list looks like. Um, list item, that's just a string. Strings don't have to be quoted in YAML most of the time. Uh, there's another list item, it's also a string. Uh, then I have a nested list. Notice the syntactic indenting. So this says that it's the third element in the outer list, and then has two elements under it, and then this is the fourth element down there. It's exactly what it looks like. Um, note, however, that that blank hyphen is actually necessary for reasons that are probably relatively obvious. Dictionaries are also pretty simple. It's key, colon, value, one per line. Um, much like any other kind of dictionary, you can't repeat keys because that's what they're hashing. Um, and again, any well-formed YAML value is okay. So this is a dictionary I've got, um, and I should have had three dashes, and I don't, my bad. Um, so I've got the key name, my name, the key location, and then as a sub-dictionary, a city and state of Pflugerville in Texas, which is where I live. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about Booleans in YAML, uh, in YAML, but I'm going to talk about Booleans in Ansible. Ansible will interpret several different types of values as Booleans when they appear in playbooks. Um, yes or no is the preferred, you know, it, it's the Booleans that appear in the documentation. One or zero also work. True or false also work. The documentation uses yes or no, so we will also. Okay, that's all the YAML you, you should need to know. Really, you just need to be able to read it, and by the time you've read through a few of them, you'll be able to write it really easily. So now we're going to actually talk about Ansible. And we're going to start by talking about playbooks. Um, playbooks are YAML, f are at their most fundamental level, playbooks are YAML files that contain, it, at minimum, one or more hosts and one or more tasks. Um, hosts are the computers on which you are running your tasks. So where is this stuff going to be done? And tasks are, what is it that you are doing? Make sense? And actually, I should stop really fast and say, any questions on what I've gone over? Because I went over at least a decent bit. Anybody? Sure. I will make the slides available after the talk. Uh, I'll, I'll upload them to speaker deck, and they'll be available alongside the video. Mm -hmm. OK, um, so hosts. The purpose of Ansible, I guess I probably should have opened with this. So forgive me for being a little bit disjointed. Ansible is server orchestration software. Um, it's a way of saying, I want to do certain things on a bunch of different machines at once. Or more accurately, I want to get a bunch of different machines at once into a particular state. And I'll go over the difference between those two things I just said in a moment. So say I want to go install Python 3 on these 10 servers. That's the kind of thing that Ansible does, although usually much more complicated versions of it. Um, so the host is the machine that's being operated on. Um, in Ansible, the, the set of hosts available is called an inventory, and you actually have to specify your inventory. So what you don't usually do in Ansible is say, Ansible space, and then the thing that you're running, and then the host name. You actually have to have an inventory file that defines the machines that you're using. There are ways in Ansible to have a dynamic inventory. So say that you have a, a AWS account or a DigitalOcean account or a Rackspace account or whatever, you can hook it up with those credentials and it just knows about all the servers that are there. Um, it can use the tags and such that are available within your uh, account to, to tag things. We're not gonna go into that in detail. For now, we're just gonna use a flat file. Um, so later, and I'll, we'll come back to this and I'll walk you through it when we get to our first exercise, you'll need to actually make an inventory file with 
your IP address that Megan is giving you. Um, and it'll look something like this. It'll just be a flat file called inventory, and it'll have in your any format, you know, an all and then an IP address. Why did I put this slide here? Because I'm not smart. Oh well, I'll talk about it anyway. Um, so facts. <laughs> um, so when you're running Ansible on a host, Ansible will determine certain facts about that host. Um, so when you log into a machine, that machine has certain properties. It has a certain amount of RAM. It has a particular operating system installed on it. Um, so you know, either say Ubuntu or Red Hat or Windows or OS X or whatnot, uh, it might have two gig of RAM on it. It might have six gig of RAM. It has something free. Um, Ansible actually gets a lot of this information and just makes it available to you in your playbook. Um, and those kinds of variables are called facts. Um, they're available just as, as any other available variable to your templates, to your uh, to clauses that you can use in tasks. So for instance, you could say that you only want to do some kind of task if there's enough RAM free, as an example. Um, an example of this is there's a fact called Ansible underscore OS underscore family, and values can be things like Debian or Red Hat or who knows what else. Um, an example of where you might use that, this particular example is, say that you want to install a package, you want to install it from apt if you're on Debian and, and from yum if you're on Red Hat. That's the kind of ways that these can be used. And timing is actually very good. So we're, I am at our first exercise. So go ahead and open your computers. Um, and this is where we'll find out all the information that I should have given you and didn't. So I want you to make a playbook. And this is the exact text of the playbook. Um, basically, you're going to run it on all hosts. And you're going to run one task which is a debug task, which all it does is spit out a message, and the message can just be hello world. And then go ahead and run the playbook on your server. Um, as a note, to do this, you will need to make an inventory file. Um, and the inventory file is, is just the, you know, the line with the IP address of your server. And go ahead and go. I'm sure people will have problems because I went through information very quickly. And so as soon as you have questions, feel free to ask. One thing I didn't give you that I'm realizing as I am looking at this slide is the command to run. Uh, it's Ansible dash playbook. Um, yep, cool. Yes, the indentation is significant. So uh, I'll explain it quickly. YAML actually uses syntactic indenting. So this is a dictionary with two keys, hosts and tasks. And then tasks is a list with one list item. That's the dash here. And then that one list item is a dictionary with two keys, name and debug. And then debug is itself a dictionary with one key, which is message. Does that answer your question? Yep. Uh, you can use spaces or tabs. I recommend spaces. And most of my examples are two spaces because slides. Um, I don't have any particular bone in the, uh, the religious war on that. It can have any extension. You end up having to specify it, but it's it's essentially a text file. The only thing is don't give it a .py extension because then Ansible will try to run it.
actually, no, I lied. Don't just want it executable, because then Ansible will try to run it. I lied about the .py extension part. It's the mode of the file that matters. Mm -hmm. And I'm running it possible locally. Let me move this thing around here. Um, so the first thing is you want to run Ansible dash playbook, not Ansible. I should say this to everyone. So quick thing, when you're running a playbook, uh, the the actual Ansible command runs ad hoc. Uh, YAML text. Since you're actually running a playbook YAML file, you want Ansible dash playbook is the actual command that you're going to be using. Yes? The inventory file is any format. You have a dash right there where you don't want one. Yes. Okay, let me step around. You need a space, two spaces. Yeah, right there. Now you're good. You'll need to pass one flag, which is the inventory file, and it's dash i. When you hit dash dash help. Let me get him oh. first, because he, no, 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 you're, you're fine. You need two spaces in front of message. There you go, perfect. Nope. Sorry, I'll get, I'll get to you, just. Yep, so you need two spaces in front of. One, one quick second. Okay, so three people have had this problem, so I'm going to point it out um, because that's on me and not them. There are, this is, in, this is an additional sub indent here. Message is a, is a, message hello world is a sub dictionary under debug. So you're going to want at least one additional space under the, between debug and message. And someone asked me for something. You? The, the way you did it is almost exactly, actually, it, the way you did it is perfectly fine. That was, that was good to me. Great, great, great question. Um, I should have thought of that. So the easiest thing to do would be to very quickly set yourself up a, uh, a, a put your public key on the server. Okay. Alternatively, there is a way to specify the password in Ansible, and I will look up what it is, because you're not going to be the first person to ask that. <laughs> or you will not be the last person to ask me that. Actually, I do know what it is. It's uh, in Ansible dash playbook. If you run it with dash dash help, it will give you a, it gives you a way to specify the SSH password. Yes. No, you're fine. 
Uh, the problem that you're having is that debug is left aligned with name. Uh, you can just save it as. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not parsing your question. I apologize. Where do I save this file? Anywhere, it doesn't matter. On my desktop. I can't it's save it like this. How can you save it on your desktop? I have run it on my phone, but I can't. So, you, okay, so I go. Have this on my phone. Yep, so go ahead and save the save the file. Okay. Um, but first, go ahead and fix your indentation. So you need deb you need the D and debug to align with the N and name. There you go. Okay. Okay. So, so now it's saved. So go to your terminal and type ansible dash playbook. Space dash SL. So this is the so this is the command to run the playbook. And then as a positional argument it takes the YAML file. So tilde tilde slash desktop slash playbook. Okay, let's see it. So, so then at this point, I just want to make sure. Uh, looks fine to me. Do we have a dynamic tally? Go ahead and uh, pop out of that. Do we have a prefix tally? Prefix. Do we have a Dolly Joseph? May I? I gave you, okay, and so now what you're going to need to do is put in your uh, password, which there's, that's a, that's a switch you can send to Ansible Playbook. Yes? I'm about to tell the entire class that, because that's my mistake. Hey, folks. I made a mistake that uh, has not been caught, so I want to correct it for all of you, which is this is not quite correct. You need a dash in front of hosts and to indent accordingly. I'm actually going to change it on the slide now. It is now fixed on the slide, and I apologize for the error. The format for the inventory file is uh, basically in any format. So the, the standard square bracket stuff at the top, and then it's just one server per line. I think the square bracket part is actually optional, but I wouldn't swear to it. Were you? Right, OK. So yep. So. Go ahead and hit dash dash help, and there's a switch to send the, you're going to send it the root password, obviously, because it doesn't matter if they know it. Uh, yeah, that'll work. That Actually, that's what you want to do. I would be happy to. Okay, so there it is. Mm -hmm, looks it has good. no extensions. Mm -hmm. That should work. That should work. That's the focus of that slide. Um, that goes in the back. Okay. So I am going to. Is that, is that my playbook now? That's in your playbook. That's in my playbook. So okay. open that playbook. And everything I need to play with. Um, is that the playbook? Correct. All right, save the playbook. Yeah, it needs to be aligned with hosts. And then, obviously, realign everything under it accordingly. No dash. No dash. Um, oh, yep. that's right. Okay. 
Well, it, it didn't help that I made a mistake on the slide, too, thus confusing everybody. They don't. Um, so just run Ansible playbook with dash K, and it will ask you for the password. If you were to have a uh, SSH password list, then it would have just magically worked. I think there actually is a way to specify it in the inventory file, but don't. I, if, if you would like to go ahead and quickly set yourself up a public key on the server, feel free to do it. I'm going to wipe the server at the end of the tutorial. So this, this identity that you just gave me to run the command with dash K, and, mm -hmm. and then it will ask you for your password, and then it will run perfectly. It looks like other than that, you're probably done. Yeah, Megan should have emailed it to you. I'm sorry, did you ask me a question? Uh, Ansible dash playbook. Be right there. No, 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 no. The command is not Ansible. It's Ansible dash playbook. I will. I will know how to teach that particular bit better next time. Yes. Be right there. What the heck? So, yeah, I'm curious where that exactly. <laughs> inventory is coming from. Sorry. So Where's you have, you must have an inventory file that it's somehow reading, and I have no idea where it's reading from. Yeah. Specify the inventory file that I had you write with dash i, and right. Oh, where's? Sorry, could you cap in your inventory file? No, that's your playbook. Okay. Sorry, your inventory file. Oh, I'm still curious how you got that. You must have one somewhere that's environment variables so specified. But go ahead and make one. So just like via inventory, and then it's just uh, the IP address of the host that Megan gave you. Yes. Program Ansible playbook is not installed. Did you pip install Ansible? I just kept the server. I was okay. Like I was one of the guys. Like Completely fine. Uh, pip install Ansible. And your situation is going to be a little different because you're going to be running locally, but that's fine. Um, so you want to just create one? Yeah, so create a new file and then do uh, bracket all. Bracket. Yep. And then on the next line, specify the IP address of the server. Megan should have given you an IP address. Perfect. Give me one quick second. Sorry. Uh, just so I'm kind of tracking status and adjusting accordingly, who is done with the exercise? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so a few people. You probably have to install it. I apologize. I did not know that. Perfect. For those who are not done, give me like one sentence things on what people are stuck on so I can try to know. If everyone's stuck on the same thing, I want to make sure to push forward. Doesn't recognize your host? Anyone else? Okay, someone else just had that. Yeah, if you were on, if you're on, 
any type of Linux, it seems like you need SSH fast installed and you can yum or apt it. I did not encounter that because I was on a Mac. Not recognizing your host? Uh, bracket all brackets at the top oh, of the inventory file. Yeah, but the word all between the brackets. Oh, e. yeah. no, Ansible dash playbook is your command, not Ansible. Sorry. No, you're not. A, you're not a moron. You're learning. There, we go. Yeah. there you go. And now you're going to hit the problem that everyone else is having, which is you need to uh, install SSH pass and use dash k. Okay. Yes. Sorry. So the obvious question I would ask is if the password is correct, but presumably you just copied and pasted I it. Can you uh, go ahead and SSH root at? that thing and make sure that password works? Um, okay. I mean, just yeah. dumb, dumb check, right? Yeah. Make sure it's, could be a, I have no idea. Yes? So you're using, you're trying to log in as your user. Uh, you probably want to log in as root would be the first thing. You can put it. You can put the user in the playbook itself. I'm a little surprised that it's not just defaulting to root, which is what I thought it did. But that might be a version difference or something. So go ahead and in your playbook, uh, just do user colon root is top level. I mean, I mean between host and tasks, or or it's a, it's a dictionary, right? So no, your user should be root unless you're using a machine that isn't the one that Megan gave you. Yep, cool. And then, no, it's still gonna fail, but it will fail establishing oh, connection I for root, see, which so is fine. Oh, s a space, sorry. Yeah. I actually thought that was gonna work because the thing was highlighting, but apparently not. Okay, so now we're trying to so now add dash k and it will prompt you for a password. Thank you very much. And it might ask you to. Yes. Um, this has the same kind of. That's weird. Google then uh, this is installed, uh, but it ha I hasn't been tested yet. So I have the inventory file. The only guess I can make, I have heard, I've never tried to do it, but I've heard that Ansible doesn't play nicely with virtual env. So I'm guessing that that is. If you install it in a virtual env, I'm guessing that that's the problem. Install in the virtual env, and then that might be it then as well. Okay, this is great. Yep. This is better, right? Yep. Perfect. Yes. Um, you uh, you can use dash k, which will prompt you for password, or feel f or feel free to set up an SSH key on the server if you prefer. By the way, we're wiping these servers at the end of the tutorial. So if you want to do something like set up your public key on the server, please feel free. Um, whatever is easiest for y'all is fine. You can SSH into it without a problem. Um, so it's establishing connection for user Bill. You want root. So. I am not sure. Would you uh, dash dash uh, help for me, please? I think it. Go, so the way that I know to do it, which is the way that I'll teach you, because it's the one I know, is go to your playbook. Uh, go ahead and you and one other person have had this problem, and everyone else has been on route. It must be a version difference. You have the same problem? Oh, then so. Just add a uh, dictionary item for user colon root in the playbook. Yeah. Exactly. And that seems to work for you as well. I think that must be a version thing, or it might be an environment variable that's set.
You got it? Oh. Yep, you got it. Mm -hmm. You can do you can do user equals root you can do user equals root in the inventory file or you can do it in the playbook. Either one. Can you run with uh, can you run with uh, dash v v v v so I can see it? I'm guessing you're having the problem that a couple other people are having. Yep, four exactly. Yep. So you want to establish as root um, instead of moso. So there's a couple ways you can do it. The easy one is probably just uh, in your playbook itself. Um, add user root as a top level dictionary item. No, no hyphen. Yep, user equal, user colon root, or colon space root, colon. Yep, try it again. And now the problem is that it doesn't have your password, so add dash k, and it will prompt you for it. Yes. You're still having problems with that. Can I speak? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, app can't see Ubuntu version. Wait, what? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Helps if I spell it right. Spelling. Well, yeah, but now it still just puts it in installs. Oh, unable to set some archives. Large amounts of text doing important things. Well, that's going to be fun. What the hell?
Yeah, if you want to try that, in install it that way. I might, I might have to punt on that. Okay. Let's push frame. Who is still working on getting things going? Could I see a show of hands holding? Still several. Okay. What are the what are the problems that we're encountering? It says gathering facts and stops. Anyone having a different problem other than that? Okay. Uh, did you run with dash v v v v? It will give you pretty detailed output if you do. Just one, just one dash. There you go. Anyone else still have an outstanding problem? Okay. Yep. If you're having connection problems, so this is actually one of the most common problems using Antibal is getting over the initial connection issues. Um, so this is actually pretty common. Um, use dash VVVV and it will give you really detailed information on how it's trying to connect. It will tell you what user it's trying to connect as. Make sure it's root. If it's not root, then you want to specify that. Um, and it, assuming that you haven't decided to go put your public key on the server, then you'll want to use dash K, which will prompt you for a password. Is everyone else in good shape? Or is anyone having a problem that isn't that? Oh, that's right, you were. I apologize. Could you run with uh, dash VVVV? Yeah, should be able to. So on route, port 22. Authentication or permission failure, not having permission on the remote directory. Consider changing the remote syntax and answer user's intent. What's your, what? Remote module setup. Remote module should have been debug. Can you see your playbook? Looks like debug to me. May I uh, see your commands again? Example one dot yaml. Example one dot yaml. Why is it trying to run setup? I'm just going to butt through it real fast and see if I can. Yeah, just in case it changes anything, I don't think it will. Having done that, I just wiped out your password from the. Oh, go and grab it. Yep. Changing the password to root. Well, that's special. Oh. Your new password is foo. Oh, nope. You must choose a longer password. I 
hate you all. Usually nobody else had that problem. I had no idea. It works now. Foo bar one two three. Feel free to change it to something else. I, why you were the only person who it wanted to do that? I had no idea. Anyone else still stuck? You are still stuck, and you're definitely still stuck. You got it. Checking is enabled in. The thing that I would try first would be don't run it with sudo. It says that it's not supposed to run it with sudo. I don't think it's supposed to run it with sudo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's the other thing. It's the other. No one else is. This will just make the difference in what everyone else has. Post key checking is enabled. Do you have a non standard uh, SSH config in here? No. No? Sure you do. Or if there is, please let me know. Or if it's not there, please let me know. No, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Tell you what, can you shell in normally? Like SSH space root at. He had that problem, and nobody else had, which is really bizarre. So, so do that. If that doesn't work, then the easy way to solve the problem would be to just put your public key on the server. Um, it looks like you typed it wrong. OK. Am I good to move on, or do you want me to? Wait for you to finish, okay. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start moving on. It seems like pretty much everybody is done. There's a couple of exceptions. Is there anybody who distinctly wants me to wait? Seeing no hands, okay. So what you guys made was a playbook. It you had one host, which is your inventory file, and it had one task. And that task was basically debug output. Um, it had debug colon, and then it had a, a message that you just sent, which was hello world. That was the, the task, and it obviously is a no-off. It does nothing. A couple things that I'm going to note about that, the output, assuming that you have a colors in your terminal, was green. Green means that there aren't any changes. If a task actually affects a change on the box, then the output would be yellow. And if the task fails, it's red. Tasks can also be skipped, which is a light blue color. So green means no changes. Yellow means task succeeded, but made a change. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that in a little bit. 
Yes. No, it's a lighter. It's a distinctly, it's much lighter. It's a cyan blue. The, so, the, so she asked a great question that I'm going to repeat into the mic because I don't know if the video will have gotten it. The debug out, many of you had to look at debug output to figure out network things, you know, getting your password in and all that kind of stuff. That was a very dark blue color. The skipped is a, light, uh, is a much lighter blue color. It's a cyan. Okay, so tasks. A task describes a state which shall have obtained on the machine. I worded that very precisely and unfortunately very confusingly. So the rest of this uh, slide is all explanation of that sentence. So who has heard of the word idempotent? More than I thought. Well done. So tasks are intended to be idempotent, which means that if you run them more than once, they don't do anything if, the, if, the, you know, if that state has already obtained. So a task doesn't really actually mean, hey, remote machine, go thou and do x, y, z. A task does mean, go and ensure that x is done. If it is not, which means, of course, if it's not done, do it. If it is done, do nothing. Um, if you run make dir slash foo slash bar and or make your dash p slash foo slash bar, what happens? It makes a directory, right? And it gives you a zero exit status. What happens if you run it again? It errors, right? It says directory already exists, and the exit status is one, probably. I'm not actually sure. Um, I didn't check. That's not idempotent. Make your says, no, I'm not going to create this directory. I'm going to fail with an error because this has already happened. Tasks are idempotent. If a task has already happened, it just gleefully says, hey, I don't have to do anything. And you get green output, in fact. If it has to do something, you get yellow output. So tasks are described in YAML, and they're a list. So when you wrote your task list, you had tasks colon, and then you had a list item. It was one task in the list, which was debug. These are amazingly uncomfortable. Um, you had one task in your list, which was just debug. Um, we're going to start looking at multiple tasks in a series in a minute. Each list item is a separate task, and they're executed in sequence. If any task fails, then the, the caboodle stops. It says, oops, task failed, I'm done. If you're, excuse me, if you're running on multiple servers, however, a task failure on one server will stop all future tasks on that server, but all the other servers will continue. So say that you have 10 servers, A, B, C, all the way through J, and you have a series of tasks that runs. If the third task fails on, say, server C, then server C won't try to do tasks 4 through 10, but all the rest of them will go through the entire sequence and succeed. Make sense? Questions on that? OK. So tasks always, always, always have a name, which was hello world in the task that you guys wrote it a second ago, and a dictionary key for the module that the task is using. We're going to talk about modules. If you go to the Ansible documentation, which is docs.ansible.com, the like four-fifths of the documentation is just documentation on every module. It's a list of modules, and modules basically encompass the stuff that Ansible does. Um, and we're going to look at a decent number of them just by way of example. So this is an example of a slightly more complicated task that is more representative of what you might actually want to do on a server. So what this task does is it ensures that a user exists on the machine. So the task has a name. And this is, this is free form. You know, I, I, this is essentially kind of sort of a comment. If you look at your playbook runs on the um, exercise I gave you earlier, you would have seen it, it say, hello world at the top in white with a bunch of stars. The name is, the name is where that comes from. Here, we have user because it's using the user module. The user module in Ansible is for, well, making users, creating 
users on the machine, adding them, deleting them, changing their passwords, all that kind of stuff. Well, what is this going to do? Well, it's going to create a user. It's going to give me the home directory of slash home slash Luke. We're going to assume that this is not a Mac. It's going to give me the username of Luke. It's going to set my shell to slash bin slash bash and not sh or whatever the default is. State present. I'm going to talk about this more in a minute. So state is Ansible's for what is the action being done. If you've come from another orchestration tool like Chef or, or Puppet or such, usually it's something like create user. In Ansible, it's what is the final state that the user should be in. It should be present on the machine. It should be there. If you wanted to delete the user, the state would be absent instead of present. Does that make sense? And again, if the user is already absent, then it will just gleefully say, hey, the user's absent. I don't have to do anything. If the user's already present, in this case, it will gleefully say, hey, I don't have to do anything. If the user is absent and it hits this, then it will create the user. Make sense? And it will give you yellow output. And in system call and no, uh, this is, there's a switch that you can send to add user, which is whether or not it's a system user um, versus a, you know, a login one. Um, and, and I'm setting that to no. Most of these are optional. The only thing that Ansible actually requires, I think, is name. And user add, the, the Unix command user add, which is what this will run under the hood, will use its sensible defaults for everything else. So it will say, OK, if you just type user slash sbin slash user add space Luke, it knows what the home directory is. It, it will default to a shell. It will use bin slash, slash sh on every system I've ever used. And it will not be a system user. So this doesn't need to be there. This does, because I don't want the default. And this doesn't really. However, remember that explicit is better than implicit. So there's value in having some of these things, although system no probably is really not doing anybody any good. And then the other thing I'll mention about this is that remember that Ansible is often used to configure machines that aren't necessarily all the exact same OS. So what happens if one of your OSs defaults to shell to bin slash sh and one of them defaults to bin bash? If you don't include the shell, then you're going to get different things on different machines. And you really want to have them be as similar as possible. So you know, something like that's valuable, valuable to include. Most Ansible modules do take a key called state. There's almost always a default, and it's almost always present. Um, I would like to Soapbox encourage you to go ahead and specify that. I think it's valuable when you're reading playbooks later. But there is a default, and it is present um, almost all the time. Does anybody not fundamentally understand what this task does? Questions? Do you think that you could write a? Do you think you could write a task making you know relatively simple modifications on this? Okay, I think so. Okay. So that task will run all the time. Now, again, it's idempotent, so usually it does nothing. Once the user is created, the first time the task runs, it's done. But sometimes tasks are more conditional than that. Um, maybe you only run them in certain cases. Um, say that you have a task that only runs on Debian and Ubuntu. I can give you a great example for this. There's a module for apt. There's another module for yum. They're not the same module. If you're using the apt module, and you try to run it on a Red Hat system, what happens? Yes, task fails. Red, oh no. It won't work because Red Hat doesn't have apt. Similarly, if you try to run y the yum module on an Ubuntu system or a Debian system, what's going to happen? The exact same thing because yum isn't on Ubuntu systems. So in that case, and I'm going to show you an example of this in a moment, you would need to tell it hey, I want you to install this thing using apt, but only do it if I'm on an Ubuntu box or a Debian box or something with apt on it. Another case is maybe you only want to run a task if a previous task had a certain result. That does happen in Ansible reasonably frequently. I see you doing something in the back. She's excited about that. 
Or maybe you just want to run it only if the moon is made of green cheese. If you can find that uh, Ansible fact, then you can use it. It's not really there. There's a key for this in tasks, and it's the win key. And it, it takes an expression, and I'll talk a little bit more about expressions later. But for now, I'm just going to show one and hand wave and say, this is an expression, believe me. And it will skip the task if the expression is false. That comes back to that skipped, remember, where I said it would be in light blue? Um, that's, that's where this comes in. Um, so I'm going to be talking about templates and such later. Templates use Jinja. Um, if you've used Jinja, is a templating engine written by Armin Ronisher. Uh, it's basically a strictly superior implementation of DTL, uh, the Django templating language. That's what Ansible uses. Um, you don't have to. You don't have to encode it in the in the curly brackets. Ansible will just do that in this case. So here's an example of a task that has a win clause, and it's in fact the apps example. So Again, this is my name. This is essentially a freeform comment. What am I doing? I'm installing Python 3. I'm using the apt module. So it's going to run, it's going to use apt-get underneath the hood. What package do I want to install? Well, I want to install the Python 3 package, which is what it's called in, at least in Ubuntu and presumably in Debian as well. What's the state that I want it to be in? I want Python 3 to be present on the box. If I said state absent, then that would obviously app get uninstall the package. Make sense? But here's the thing. I don't want this to fail if I run it on a Red Hat box. So I have this win clause. Win Ansible OS family, which is the name of the fact. This is something you'd have to look up in the documentation. Um, win Ansible OS family equals the string Debian. Yes. You next. No, 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 no. You first. Her next. I was just telling her I was going to get to her. Because apt and yum are probably about the only case where that would actually make sense, and it would be inconsistent. Just looking at that example, that's exactly what you think it should do. But in the, the broader scheme, that's about the only case where that would make sense. And also, it's kind of explicit is better than implicit on your errors. So if you do this, and for, like as soon as you write, if, so lots of playbooks you will write, and you're really only targeting one operating system. If you're, if you're use, doing your company's infrastructure in Ansible, probably your company is using all of the same type of box. Like you might have some Ubuntu 12 and some Ubuntu 14, but you probably don't have Ubuntu and Red Hat running your, your infrastructure. So for a lot of people, they don't worry about this at all. But what happens is when you go to start running playbooks that are going to be reusable in other places, or if, say, your company has two different divisions, but they share some things, and maybe one division runs Red Hat, one division runs Ubuntu, that seems really possible, right? So what happens is team A over here gives their playbook to team B that's running a different type. If, and team A didn't put this win clause. If, if the thing just guessed it for you, then you have this really weird failure way down the line because it expected Python 3 wouldn't be there, right? At this point, it will just fail really loudly saying, hey, I don't have apt-get. I can't do this thing. And as soon as you actually write this win clause in this example, you as the person writing the playbook is going to go, OK, I need to handle this for Red Hat too. I'm going to have something right underneath it that says, install Python 3, yum, same thing. Um, so, so that's the philosophical answer. You had a question? It would do whatever the package manager does, I'm fairly certain. So whatever app get uninstall does is what it's going to do. I'm fairly certain it runs app get up, uh, uninstall, and, it, and I don't think it runs any of the subsequent stuff. Like, you'll, when you run app get uninstall, you'll get, like, here are these other packages that you don't need anymore because they're dependencies. Use app get auto remove to remove them. I believe it does not do that. Um, in fact, I'm fairly certain it does not do that. But it's Generally, the rule on this kind of thing is going to be it's using something under the hood. You should probably know what it is, and it's going to be whatever that thing does. So if app get uninstall of a particular package removes the config file, then this will too. If it doesn't, then it won't. More questions? Anyone? Nope. Okay, moving on. 
Task, okay, so soapbox. Tasks task should be inimpotent whenever possible. Um, inimpotency means that the task ensures a state. A subsequent run is a no-op unless the machine got out of that state. If you run this task, and then you shell into the box and app get remove Python 3, and then you run the task again, obviously it will again do something because it has to get it back into that state. But if you just run it twice in a row, the second time it should be green. Most Ansible modules are impotent without your having to think about it, but it obviously matters if you're writing modules. Also, there are a few that aren't. The obvious one for this is the shell module, which runs an arbitrary shell command. There is no way for Ansible to make that impotent by itself. It can't be done. Um, it's too freeform. Um, so you have some tools for this, like, say, the win uh, bit that we looked at earlier. Um, and also, sometimes non impotent modules will have their own impotency tools. The shell one has, a, has a, a key called creates that you give a file name. And if that file name is present on the machine, then the shell knows to, to no op and do nothing. So now I'm going to give you some opinions on tasks. Um, the first one is use the indented form that I've shown you. There's another format where you specify the entire path as a string. So it would be like user colon and then uh, a bunch of like key equals value, space key equals value, space key equals value. Don't do that as ugly. Um, that requires a slightly special syntax with shell that w the first time you have to do it, you'll mess it up and then you'll go read the documentation and you'll find it. Um, when applicable, provide state explicitly. And next is be consistent about the way that you write your n task names. Um, I, the names show up in the Ansible runs when you're actually viewing the output. It's, they're really, really, really valuable so that you know what you're doing. Think of them, honestly, as your primary commenting mechanism. You can use YAML comments all day long, but the names are great for that. They're a description to the person running the thing of what is actually happening. Um, personally, I like complete sentences with proper capitalization and a period. I just think that's better. Uh, we're going to have our break in about 10 minutes, so I'm going to give you one more exercise. We're probably not going to do all the exercises that I have set up, but I think that this one's probably useful. So go ahead and write. Uh, you know, take your playbook that you wrote with your debug, get rid of that debug task, or leave it, doesn't really matter, and write tasks that create a user for you on the machine. Um, you can set a password if you like. Uh, install the Python 3 package from apt, and then copy a file. Um, and just make a file with a text hello world um, and that is on your local machine somewhere and have it place, be placed on the remote machine in your home directory as hi.txt. The modules that you need are user, apt, and copy. Pro unless they do it really, really quickly. It was not supposed to be out for 10 minutes. OK, if you would like to go ahead and get get chow now, feel free. If you want to stay in here, we'll, we'll intermingle it and we'll be kind of, kind of easy about that. Um, I, won't start, I won't start doing more exposition for at least 15 minutes. And I am, of course, available to answer questions, although I'm going to go grab juice in a second. Thank, thank her, she did all the work. Yeah, thank her, she did all the work. On an iPad in the back. Create droplet, create droplet. Oh, this is actually pretty good grub. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with fruit.
is everybody working on the exercise having success? Does anyone need help? You forgot the hosts. Yeah, I didn't see that in the chat. <coughs> right. So, um, so. Can I just use the arrow command that I've created for the host? Yes. So this is just a single tap. You, it's not a full playbook. So, yeah, oh. that's not the right spot. Okay. Yeah. Do you happen to have the old playbook one that you wrote for the last exercise, yeah. or did you wipe yeah. it out? Go ahead and grab that. And go ahead and copy it. I'm, I'm going to let him trickle in. Okay, okay. so see how this is hosts yes. and then tasks, and then under there is the tasks. Yeah. So get rid of the stuff under tasks and replace it with your new tasks, and you should be good. Uh, cool, thank you. Yep. Do you understand why it is that way? Um, yeah. We'll it's be talking. Right. We'll be talking about it later. There is a concept called roles where you do have tasks in separate files, and that would have worked. Okay. Um, but it doesn't work in the particular context you're trying to do it in. Anyone else have questions on the exercise? Ansible OS family. And if you are trying to run this against a Red Hat system, then just replace app with yum. And it should work just fine. You don't actually need the when clause since you're not trying to run it on, but if you just want to have it there for your reference later, then you know, that's not a bad idea. Can I get a show of hands? Is anyone done with the exercise? One in the corner. Remember also that tasks are impotent, so it is completely fine to have your playbook run the first task, test the playbook, add the second task, test that, so on and so forth. That will work. And there is nothing wrong with doing it. In fact, it is a very good pattern. Test early and often. needs to be next to none. So we just batch those twice. Oh, okay. And is it just the YML? Uh, it's just, it, much like Python, it doesn't have, like within each one it has to be the same, but that's it. Did you have a question? I have an answer, maybe. Mm -hmm. Bob has like a week six or something like this nature of that. Uh -huh. um, so that's what I did. D E S T. Ah. Yeah. 
yeah, dex is D E X T. Destination, not nearly clear enough. Wow, that back gather takes a while. I wonder if is everyone's back gather taking a while? I'm used to that being almost instant. There we go, finally. I thought I was gonna have to go outside and learn French by immersion while I was waiting. Your taps are taking forever too. Uh, that's are people is is anyone else having really slow fat gathering and task running, or is it just one person? Yours is slow? I wonder what the difference is. Fat caching is a thing, but his is taking like ridiculously long to like create the user too. Like everything is being super slow. Maybe we you, maybe you just got a crappy droplet. You do it exactly the way you did it. Yep. Yep. So what's happening there is the uh, what's happening there. The documentation is showing you a different format. So you could have done user colon space home equals name equals all space separated, but don't do that because it, it's really ugly when you have more than about two things. But yeah, what you're what you're looking at there is that's an alternative format that does also work. I probably should have shown it on the slide. So, that, yeah, that's what I was just telling him. So, that's an alternative format, and I recommend doing it my way. Well, it's more when you have like I it's use Sublime Text, but I have like drastically edited my team language file, like really, really, really drastically at this point. I write a lot of Ansible because I work there. And I do an insane amount of like weird things. So I've got stuff to say it's like if it's when it j it knows it's Gen Jedi, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Other than you, you need a space after the colons in name and state, but other than that, you are other than that, you're completely fine. Mm -hmm. For those using Sublime Text or TextMate or anything that uses TM language files, the default TM language file for YAML will not complain if you don't have a space after your colon in your dictionary keys. You, however, do need it. It is not valid YAML without it. You do have to have a space after your colon. The TM language file does not know that, but it is nonetheless the case. Mm -hmm. It got to file, it got state, mm -hmm. it got home. 
it as prophesying it to him now when it doesn't show up yet? Be so probably because it's a default. Okay. I'm pretty sure you can try if you want. I'm not completely sure, but if you want to test it, create another user with system yes and see what it does. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's just because it's the default. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. If I'm wrong about that, tell me. So, so first of all, it's coming out. Uh, let's get rid of this one. We won't talk about this right now. Yeah, no, that's fine. I was just going to comment that out for one second. So this actually is valid. This is another valid way to write. Um, to write it, I don't like it because when you start to have like nine things across the, it starts to get hard to read. So, but this actually is valid as this if you want to use this format. But this message, but you can't mix them. Um, if you mix them, it doesn't work. Basically, in YAML, this is a string, and then Ansible is parsing it out. I would be. Python 3 is the name of the package. That is the way that I, that I personally do it. Now, I will mention that is an opinion. Okay, getting a quick status check here. Who has gotten at least two or th at least one or two of the tasks going? Has anybody not gotten any of the tasks going? Nobody. Who has all three? Almost everybody. Okay. Anybody not have any tasks last call? I'm going to go ahead and move on. Does anybody not want me to move on? Uh, I don't have it up on speaker deck right now. Yep, go for it. Anyone else? Okay, moving on. So variables. You can use variables within tasks as well. Remember I talked about facts earlier, like Ansible OS family? You can also define your own variables in variables files. And there's a few other ways to make variables available. I'm not going to go through them all other than to say that they exist. And it's kind of one of those when you need it in, in various different ways you'll find out. Um, Ansible uses a templating engine called Jinja2 for evaluating templates generally and specifically uh, for, for variable data. The YAML, uh, there's a, a bunch of special weird parsing within the YAML and where Jinja2 is used. Um, but fundamentally, that's what ha what's happening. If you're familiar with, if you're not familiar with Jinja2, if you are familiar with Django templating language, Jinja2 is very, very similar. Um, it's, it's written to work very, very similarly to that, but it's not quite the same. Um, basically, what that means is that variables are enclosed within double curly, bra uh, curly braces. So here's an example of how that might be. Say that you have a variable called important user that you've defined somewhere else. I'm not worrying about where right now. Just I'm stipulating that there is a variable called important user defined. So now. I want to create an important user. This is almost the exact same example we saw earlier. User module, 
Where's its home directory? Well, it's in slash home slash and then whatever the value of important user is. Again, what's the name? Whatever the value of important user is. Shell, bin, bash, state, present, system, no. Does this make intuitive sense to everybody? I'm going to call one thing out before moving on in this slide. You'll notice I did one thing here that you might not have seen, which is I added quotes on name. See how there's a quote here and here. Remember, YAML doesn't require you to quote strings most of the time. Most of the time is the key phrase there. There are exceptions. This is one of them, and here's why. Remember I told you that Ansible dictionaries, in addition to being able to be specified this way, can also be specified with curly braces, like a Python dictionary. This will confuse the parser, because it, does, it, it will think that this is supposed to be a dictionary and fail with a YAML parsing error. Ansible actually has something. It's great. Ansible Playbook actually has something that will check for this exact problem and give you a very useful error message if you forget. So if I didn't have these quotes here, you would fail with a parse error, and it would say it actually says something effective. This is a pretty easy one to fix. It will give you the line number of your file and say, go quote your string. It happens so often that there's a big special check-in for it. Um, but it also happens so often that I'm going to point it out. That's the only case in where you need it. If it's a variable within another string, like here with home, I don't have to do anything. The, the reason why it's necessary here is because the brace starts, starts the value. And so the YAML parser sees it and says, dictionary. Make sense? Yep, question, go. No. Yeah, no, not, not even remotely. Combination of personal style and uh, makes it easier to see whether the variable begins and ends. Type within the string. No. Okay, so uh, I talked earlier about conditional execution. I'm bringing it back up again because I want to talk again about variables. Sometimes you need the, the, you know, if it's a thing where it could be a string and could be a variable, you need the Jenja braces. But sometimes Ansible knows that it's always a variable or always an expression. And when is a case like that? So here I'm installing Python 3 if it's Debian, and the next task I'm installing it if it's Red Hat. Ansible already knows that anything that comes after a win is an expression. It just, there's no other case where it makes sense. It, it, there's no value in saying win string. So it's always a Jinja expression, so you don't have to quote it, uh, to Jinja quote it. I am fairly certain that it will still work if you do, but you don't have to. Oh, that was someone outside. I thought that was someone asking a question. OK, loops. Ansible provides a decent number of looping mechanisms and also provides ways to specify your own. The most common one and the one that we're going to look at here is with items. So essentially, what happens if you want a task to iterate over a dictionary or a list or something and then perform that task on every item in the list? This is how you do that. It's possible to write your own plugins to provide data to, look, to loop over. These are called lookup plugins. We'll get to those later. Loops define a variable called item, spelled I-T-E-M. Let's, uh, let's see that in practice. So this is our example from earlier with hello world, but I've added a loop. So now we're going to say hello to all the places. Still debug. You saw that earlier. What's our message? Well, our message is hello and then the string of the item. And then these are the two items. Does this make intuitive sense to everyone? This will be one task that executes twice. Questions? And all loops provide item. That's just a rule to learn. That's what it provides, is item. It, it, it will be item. Ansible causes it to be item. Whenever you use, whenever you use with, block, with underscore anything, what it provides up here is always called item. Um, now, there is no rule that says item has to be strings. Like, so item could be a dictionary, and then you'd be able to use item dot dictionary key. Uh, items could be sublists, and you could use item sub zero, item sub one, whatever. Like, any valid YAML can go under this with items as long as it's a list at the top level. 
But in this case, I just use strings. Usually, loops perform the task a separate time for each item with loop. You would get two debug messages on that previous example. There are a few occasional exceptions. Uh, the apt and yum modules in particular, and the fit modules are smart. Um, so it knows that you can just run the apt command once and have a space separated list of all your items. So if I had done apt colon package variable item with items python3, python3 dash dev, and python3 dash pip, it would run apt get dash y install and then in a space separated list of those packages. So it would run the command one time. Make sense? You don't really even need to know that. It's kind of an under the hood optimization, but that's how it works. Okay, so next exercise. I'm gonna not spend too much time here. Um, so if you think you need more, you might wanna go ahead and write this down. So modify your tasks from earlier um, to have a loop. So create a user for yourself and for me. My name is Luke, in case you don't know. And install the Python 3, Python 3 dev, and Python 3 pip packages from apt. In all cases, this should be a single task using with items. And ask if you have any questions. I have no idea. Okay. Don't care. I want to prove that you I want you to prove to yourself that you know how to do it. Any questions? You need the quotes if the string starts with the variable name, with the variable. You know, in any, in any other case, I would say yes, and I don't do it in Ansible, and I don't know why. I don't have a consistent reason, so probably yes. I don't know why I don't do it. Yep, that's exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. okay. And you'll need dashes in front of your uh, names there. Do uh, apt get update Ooh. and see if it uh, on the on your oh, update mark. I want to see if that's the problem.
also possible. I gave you the wrong package name. That's not possible. But no, that's, that's oh, impossible. yes, it is. That's impossible. Can't happen. Cannot be done. Okay, two users. There's a couple ways to do that. You can. Uh, there's actually a force. There's actually a force update in the app thing. Oh. I think. I think it's force update colon yes. I don't remember if it does it before or after the command though. This is looking beautiful. Great. Perfect. Yep. If it's failing because it doesn't know that Python three dev is there, you can run an app get update. I think force update colon yes will do it, but I'm not entirely certain. Or you can just skip Python 3 dev. As long as you're able to do it in a loop, you understand the point. Yes. Item, not items. Singular. No, 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 no. Items there, but item there and there. You good? May I see your pedestal? Sure. Your with items is actually uh, de indent that. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not an argument to the module, it's oh. an argument to the task. Indent both of those. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're arguments to user. One of the things, since two people have just asked the same question, um, one of the things that you just have to get straight as you learn Ansible, and it's the, why it's a tutorial, is the difference between an argument to the module and an argument to tasks generally. With items is an argument to tasks generally independent of the tasks. But say the, the user name or the system yes or any of those are arguments to the user module. And so they're indented under the user part. Hopefully that made sense to everyone. Who is done with the, who's done with the exercise? Couple, but not everyone. Okay, we'll do a couple more minutes. I'm going to be a little bit more ruthless about moving on for this one since it's simpler. Um, so you're having the same problem, which is you actually just need to run app get update on the box. I think force update, I think it's force update equals colon yes, but I wouldn't swear to it on the app. There's a way in the, in the Ansible app module to do that as well. Update cache colon yes, thank you. Yeah, update underscore cache colon yes. Questions, anyone? Having fewer questions on every exercise. This is probably good, I think. Either that or everyone's giving up. Uh, no. So you want, so first of all, your task needs a name, which it doesn't have. So that's the first problem. And then the next thing is um, action is not how we're doing this. We're doing it like that. And back one. There you go. And then take that. The package and the state. Put it underneath app before with items. 
invent package to match state. Get rid of everything after the app line. It should look a lot like this. And then change package to item. And quote it. Mm. And put it in quotes. Because you want a dictionary thing. And then get rid of your training quotes in there. There you go. That should do it. And you probably will also need update cache colon yes sent to apt as well for the same reason that everyone else has. Yes, you can ask me a question. I might even have an answer. With items needs to de be dedented. It's an argument to the task, not an argument to the module. So in both cases, dedent with items. Nope. Uh, Except actually, it didn't do it too far. It should line up with name and user. Yes. It should line up with name and it should line up with uh, it should line up with that. that. Yeah. Yep. Which means it needs to be below shell state and system also. Questions, questions, any more questions? Show of hands, who's done? Okay, that's enough, I'm gonna move on. Let's talk about roles. Roles are Ansible's mechanism for packaging and grouping things together in a useful way, and in particular in a reusable way. Um, roles are able to be nice, if they're done well, can be nicely and neatly moved between different projects. Um, so there, roles are Ansible's mechanism to provide reusable content. Roles must contain tasks, because otherwise the role makes no sense. And they may contain other things, such as handlers, filer, files, and templates. Excuse me a moment while I fight with my mic. Um, I haven't talked about handlers yet, but I'm going to. Files and templates are exactly what it sounds like. Basically, they're a way of it, you know, having files and templates in version control that are going to go on your servers. Um, roles give you a way to, to package those together. So the anatomy of a role is basically up to six directories. You do not have to have any directory unless you're actually using it. Uh, having it not be present won't be a problem. Uh, you obviously do need a task directory because you need tasks. And then you can optionally have a handlers directory, which is for your handlers. Again, we're going to get back to that. Defaults and vars directory, both of those do the same thing. It's a place to store variables. Um, I haven't really gone into what the defaults and vars directories do, but you can have a main.yaml file that ha defines any number of variables. Um, and you can potentially do it with some um, additional granularity, like having Ubuntu.yaml file, which would only take effect on Ubuntu, that kind of thing. That's all covered in the documentation. And files and templates are for, obviously, files and templates. Yes? Vars wins over defaults um, is, is the difference. Uh, other than the files and templates directory, all of these directories will contain a main.yml file. One thing is a lot of you guys have been using .yaml as your extension. That will matter at this point because I am 90% sure that it is main.yml. Uh, I mean, I'm definitely sure that main.yml works. I'm 90% sure that main.yaml does not. Um, not completely sure, but mostly sure. Um, within roles, roles kind of does some magic with relative pathing that mostly just works the way you think it should. If you try to use the copy module to copy over a file uh, for, your, for your circ key, it will look within the role. So you don't have to specify, you know, slash blah, slash blah, slash role, slash role name, slash files, slash blah. Just blah is enough, which is obviously good because the role is going to be in version control and on different computers and all that kind of things. Um, and the template module works the same way except within the templates directory instead of the files directory. Um, role reusability, some, some philosophy. 
generally, you want most of your roles to be reusable, and a few of them you don't. What I mean by that is, at least the way that most of my projects work, is that I have lots of reusable roles for very atomic things, say, install Java, uh, compile uWSGI, that, that sort of stuff. And then I have a role at the end that's the tie all these other things together for this specific project. That role obviously is not reusable, it's specific to the project. Make sense? Um, there's a few other ways you can do that. It sort of depends on how you, it works for your shop. Some people package up their roles um, and have them available to everyone, and then they use the playbook.yaml file, which is kind of what you've been writing so far, to have all the specific stuff. Usually I have way too much specific stuff for that. Uh, my, my last role tends to be kind of big um, and have multiple different files, so it, that starts to get unwieldy in, in, just, a in just a playbook. So, but there's some, there's some room to maneuver there. Um, there's really... The common things that I do in reusable roles are compile and install software. If your software is just app get install, then usually you don't write a role for that because that's silly, it's one task. But sometimes that's not sufficient. PostgreSQL, for instance, you probably want to do a little bit more than install. You probably want to install it, but you probably also want to set up your PGHBA file. Um, you know, you might have a, a you might want to make sure that your data is going on a different partition, blah, 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 blah. That, that kind of thing is a, a more reusable role that's more complete. Um, UWSGI, I don't install UWSGI from AppGet ever because the version's way, 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 way too old. So I have a reusable role that downloads UWSGI with a version, I, I specify a version as a variable, and it downloads it and compiles it and compiles the Python plugin and does all the things because the, the version in apt is just way too old to even be remotely functional. And then the other example is configuring utilities. Um, say, what if you want to configure your firewall? Um, IP tables. Configuring IP tables is a very, very legitimate use for a role. Um, you, know, you specify in a variable the ports that you want to have open, um, or, or have an includable file, for instance, that, that says open this port, and then you specify the port. That's the kind of reason why you, that's another example of a reusable role. Um, and then, again, the, this is the way that I do it. There are a few other philosophies, and mine is not necessarily correct, um, is that then I have usually just one, sometimes a couple, application-specific roles that kind of tie everything together in the end. Um, so here, do all these reusable components that might be used by something else, and then here's my specific thing at the end that says, make it my company's thing. Make sense? Any questions on this? Um, questions when asking about role reusability. What's the scope where the role is going to be used? Um, reusable roles is, starts to be the kind of place where you might, say, be running it in one place on Red Hat and another place on Debian and another place on Mac and another place on Windows. So you start to care about you know, the, the app yum example from earlier, for instance. Um, you know, because roles are more portable. And what configuration does the role require or allow? Does the role require something to already be done? Um, and maybe there's some reason why it shouldn't do it itself. Um, although, actually, that wasn't the question that this was intended to mean. I was meaning, what, what variables does the role define that, that you might override? So roles, again, there's a directory called defaults, which is your default variables. That gives you a ready-made space to say, hey, my uWSGI role by default is going to install 2.1, but you can go put in another version file and it will do the right thing, provided that the URL still matches, that kind of thing. Um, so, wh so what configurable options does this role allow for where you can set a variable in your playbook, um, in an environment variable, whatever else, make it available to Ansible, and suddenly the role does something slightly different than if this variable was set to something else? Of an obvious example of that might be, I had you guys write a task to create a user. Well, that's an obvious thing that could be you know, variable data. You know, have a list of users and, and their SSH keys or whatever. You can see how this can start to become a reusable role. I'm going to talk a little bit about templates. Templates are a mechanism to write files to machines that include variable data. They use Jinja 2. We've already talked about Jinja 2. Variables look like this. You've already used one. Um, Jinja 2 also has control blocks. If you use the Django templating language, you've seen this before. 
um, they have a bracket and then a percentage sign. Um, and so it looks like something like if and then an expression, do some stuff, and then an index. Uh, the common blocks that you use are if and for. There are some others. Within the scope of Ansible, you pretty much only use if and for. I can't actually remember using anything else. Uh, I'm trying to think of whether I want to skip this exercise for time or do it. Let's actually, uh, so I'm thinking about skipping this one for time, but I'll, I'll take input if anybody has an opinion. So this is writing a, a template, writing it to the machine th that uses a couple of variables. You all want to do it or skip it? You may. It's a, it's a completely fair suggestion. Um, yeah, we can do that. I'm a little nervous about time, but yeah, let's do it. So let's take, let's take about five minutes. If you want to try to catch up on previous stuff, go for it. If you want to try to work on this, um, do that. And I will move on in a little bit. You have a question. Uh, no, 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 that's fine. So the reason why you got that is because that's actually rsync underneath the hood. Synchronize is a wrapper around rsync. Okay. And rsync is prompting you to put a password separately um, because, so Ansible's already connected, issued the rsync command, and now rsync is saying, I need the password to get from here to there. Okay, so every time you do synchronize or use the synchronize module, you should expect some password keys. Well, in a real production environment, you would be setting this up with passwordless keys, like RSA or DSA or something, and that would have gotten around that. Oh, 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 oh okay. Okay, so if I had an SSH key in my head, I would not... Then it would have just used, oh, right. Oh, oh. Uh, I will say that for this particular job, I didn't expect you to use Synchronize. I expected you to use Copy. Synchronize will work. It will do oh, the job. Okay. But the Copy module was the one I actually expected you to use. Oh, okay. Beg your pardon? No, no, no. No, par no pardon required. My Try to figure out what the right module is. No, that and that's exactly the way I do it too. Um, okay. No, that's exactly the way I do it. So go ahead and in this case, look up look up copy. Okay. It is a little bit more suited for exactly what you're after. Uh, no, you're you're fine. And you don't even need the you don't even need a source file in this case. You can actually just have the content because it's just a static file, right? But so you could either have a source file on your local machine, which would be specified with circ uh, here, right. um, or you can have the content of the file. Oh, okay. And I'm, I'm guessing that in either oh, case, it shouldn't actually require the password. Like, like a, like a file, a mm -hmm. uh, so I would have to create one by mm -hmm. right. And in real life, you'll almost never use copy with content. You'll almost always have a local file because your file is checked into version control. It's usually too big. Yeah. Um, but in this case, well, that content is entirely sufficient. Right, 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 right. right. Okay. Yep. So that will probably get around it in this particular case as well. Wonderful. And copy, copy is a wrapper around SCP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's even a note on copy that says, like, don't try to use this for lots and lots and lots of files. You synchronize instead. Right. Yeah. Synchronize is for a group, copy is for one. Mm hmm. Questions, questions, any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if it takes a little if it takes a little longer and is valuable to people, I mean, 
what matters is getting out what you need to know. We'll come back in just a second. Yes. So that is because you don't have quotes after a name here. And there as well. Yeah, that's a really, really, really common mistake. Um, basically, it's a confusion because YAML thinks it's a dictionary if it starts with a curly brace. So if your string starts with a curly brace, you need quoted. You had a question? You had thinking. Okay. That's good too. Megan, could you go to the staff room and grab an easel and one of those uh, flipboards? I'm gonna I'm gonna show them the template, but I'm gonna write it on the easel rather than live code it. I don't know if we're even gonna get to that. I'm hoping we do, but I'm not gonna sweat it too much if we don't. I was planning on having to have an hour and a half to do that, and we only have an hour and twenty minutes left, and we still have two more things. We'll see. We might do it. Megan is going and getting an easel. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to show the template. I'm going to write the template for you guys. Uh, for what she was doing, she did not need a source file. You you definitely do for this. I think template might take a content parameter, but I doubt it. It doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Don't don't do it. <laughs> It's almost never useful for copy, but it's certainly never useful for template. Template is a module name, yes. Yeah, you want to be using the template module if you're doing the current exercise. If you're trying to use something else, you're doing it wrong. And the syntax is otherwise identical to copy. There, there's a couple options it doesn't take, but I, th I think it doesn't take content, for instance. Howdy, howdy. OK. I don't have the slides up yet, but I will have them on speaker deck. The tutorial will be on PyVideo, because um, they are recording it. It's usually a couple days, and there will be a link to the deck with, with it there. Cool. cool. Yep. Before you go. Is there any feedback you would like to give me on what I can do to make that not be a problem next time? That I can't do anything about. Good luck. Good luck fixing it. Yep. How is everyone doing on this example, or on this exercise thing, whatever it's called? Anyone done with it? Couple, not very many. OK, I'm going to break the rules of presentations and live code this, which I am the program committee chair, and we routinely reject proposals because they say that they're going to live code things, so don't tell anyone. Wait, we're videoing this? Crap. OK, so let's do some live coding. Let's not do that. Let's Imkater things. OK, so first of all, I need an inventory file. Way. 
There we go. First thing I use an inventory file. Yes, I can. Better? There we go. Okay, what do I need next? I need a playbook. And I need a template. Stop that. Okay, playbook. I'm going to use connection local because I'm not making a server. I'm just going to cheat. So I'm going to run against a local machine. And then I need my tasks. OK, so my task was to do what? It was to make a template. It was supposed to have all the IP addresses of the box and something else. And I think it was the OS, right? OK, so host name, thank you. So, OK, so here's my template. I don't even remotely pretend to remember what that variable name is. Ansible all IP4 addresses. Obvious enough, I suppose. OK, so this is not going to do quite what I specified in my example, but it's going to, or my exercise, but it's going to be really close. The thing that's not going to do super well is there's going to be all kinds of weird blank lines around my IPv4 colon and IPv6 colon because uh, there's going to be weird white space things going on. But I'm not going to worry about that. Uh, I didn't have you guys having these like keys here. It was just one per line, so you wouldn't have really had that problem. So there's my template. So let's do something here. Name, write my template. Template, circ, my template. Something that I'm really picky about for me is I always have my keys to the module in alpha order. Just a habit I picked up. I think it's a good one. And I'm going to write it to users, Luke, Desktop, my file dot text. I'd like it to be owned by me. Group in OS 10 is users, right? I think it is. This is why you should never live code. That look right? I think it's right. Find out. Boom. No group users. What group am I in? Staff. It's called staff, of course.
the situation of our life code. Hey, look, it worked. Let's go ahead and actually add a, except I actually don't think it worked because that should have changed something and it didn't. How's that? OK, change false group staff. Well, it says the file should be there. Let's try to cat it. That looks right to me. I'm guessing the reason why it said change false was because it probably actually wrote the file and then couldn't ch group it to users earlier. We can prove that by deleting the file. Again, okay, my template wrote, changed something. And there's my template. Look good? Questions? It is a list of all the IP version 4 addresses that the box has assigned to it. It'll be all the on any interface. So for instance, if you have uh, local and F0 and F1, it should catch all of them, I think. Although I'm noticing that I might be a liar because I don't see 127.0.0.1 on my list. So I'm not actually sure. I have actually never used that variable before today. <laughs> I've never needed it for anything. Um, the, IP, the IPv6 should be similar. It looks like it, it, looks like it probably just removes uh, removes local, which makes sense, I suppose. Any other questions? The template itself? I would be glad to. I'll even maximize it for you. Where do I get the extra? That is a result of the way that the Jinja templating works. So what happened was, so IPv4 was exactly what I expected, right? Um, they were, there's four spaces here, and there were four spaces there. The place where it wasn't correct was there were two spaces before IPv6. That's these two spaces right here, I think. I'm pretty sure. I'm almost certain. I could actually probably get rid of them by adding a minus here. We can find out. So if I run it again, it should make a change because now the, the con now it's yellow because the content of the end file has changed slightly. So that's why it's yellow. And if I cat it, oh, got something completely different. This is why you should never live code. I will leave figuring out exactly how to get the indentation the way you want as an exercise to the reader. I have spent non-trivial amounts of time doing that in real life. Uh, you, as a note, you can, you can use minuses in front of these, or uh, after these parens, and it says strip any white space between here and, and there. Um, that is actually a really, really valuable thing to know about Jenga. That's a Jenga bit, not an Ansible bit. Questions? Give you all a second to comment. Yeah, if you don't, then your, your Jenga it will come up better. That's right. Sure. Sure. And this is very specific to what I was doing in front of you. Connection local is exactly what it sounds like. It just runs the thing on the local machine. No SSH, no nothing. Um, I didn't have you guys do it that way because I wanted to actually teach going onto another box. It was very tempting and would have saved some time. But, uh, but that's what's going on there. And then other than that, everything here you should have seen before. Um, while I make, while people are, I think some people are copying this down. So while people are doing that, I'll, I'm going to make a quick point that is a little bit of a gotcha. Notice on mode, I did specify mode as a 
numeric literal, not a string, but that leading zero matters. If I specified it as integer 644, it will be 400 something. Um, or maybe it's the other way around. I can't remember exactly. Basically, you do, you do actually need to specify it as octal, or, or it will be a decimal literal. This is actually an octal literal. You can also specify it as a string, and Ansible will do the right thing. OK. I'm going to get rid of this and move on, unless someone tells me to stop in the next couple minutes. Or by minutes, I mean seconds. Yeah, uh, someone else just said that a second ago. But yes, that is correct. Congratulations, you have successfully done my, exer uh, my uh, exercise to the audience. Let's talk about handlers. Handlers are tasks, mostly. They're slightly special tasks, and what they are is they're tasks that are executed only if they are called at the end, and they're executed at the very end of the run. Um, so what's a handler for? Handlers are generally for things like restarting services. Let's say that one of the things that your, uh, your thing does is write uh, an Nginx configuration file. You then want to restart Nginx, right? But you are reload it at least. But you only want to do it if you made a change. Yes? That's what handlers are for. And also, let's say that you have three different tasks that all write different Nginx configuration files. How many times do you want to reload Nginx? Once, right? Right. So handlers are the way to do that. They're triggered by other tasks. Here's the way it works. If a task runs, and this is very key, if a task runs and makes a change, then you can specify some in, uh, using a key called notify, and it will n the task, when it makes a change, will notify any handlers that are listed. And then those handlers will run at the end of the run. If you notify the same handler more than once, it runs one time. And if the handler never gets notified, it doesn't run at all. And, um, and just a quick public service announcement. Um, dash dash force handlers is really nice. It makes it so that if you have a fail, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, it makes it so that if you have a failure, the handlers that were triggered will still run. That's almost always what you want in real life. Yes, question. Correct. So think about a case where you have three tasks that all write an Nginx config file and all notify Nginx to reload. Those three tasks will all notify it. Then any other tasks that you have will run. And then at the end, it will say, OK, now I need to run all the handlers. Was nginx.reload notified? Yes. OK. Reload nginx now. Make sense? And for, for the purpose that, that for, for which this is designed, that is usually what you want. There is a way to flush handlers if you need to trigger them early, uh, at which point it will flush them all, and then any that you know, any notification that happens after that would still do it at the end, that kind of stuff. There's a couple complicated things, but the vast majority of the time, what you want is for them all to run at the end, and you want them to run once and exactly once if they were notified in times. And, okay, so here's my example. And I used Apache in my slides and Nginx in my talkie, but that's fine. So I'm writing an Apache config file. It's based on a template, so I have some variables in there. Uh, what might be my variables? Well, the Ansible host name. Right? What, what does an Apache configuration look like? Name virtual host space IP address. Name virtual host space the host name of the box. Those are all things that could be templatized in Ansible so that the host name writes correctly. Make sense? Um, who knows what else there might be? OK, so who, who owns my Apache config file? Well, root does. Uh, what group is it in? Root. Uh, what's the mode of an Apache config file? Usually it's 644. Uh, rewrite for owner and read only for group and world. Um, path, where does, the, where does it go? This could have also been dest. Those are, those are aliases for template. Uh, and then what's the source of the file? HTTP.conf.j2. So that would be the file within my role or, or somewhere else. I would have a file in version control spelled HTTP.conf.j2 with my template information. And if running this task makes a change, this is key. If and only if running this task makes a change, 
I will notify my task called apache.restart, and I'm going to show that in a minute. If it doesn't make a change, it does nothing. So continuing this example, what happens if you do two, subs two runs right after each other? The second one isn't going to make any changes, most likely. To your, your config hasn't changed. Do you want to reload Apache in that case? No, you don't need to. There haven't been any changes. There's nothing that requires an Apache restart. So that, that's the purpose of handlers. And here's an example of a handler. Um, so this is a personal style thing. You do not have to do this. For handlers only, I style them like this, uh, kind of this variably look thing of noun dot verb. You don't have to do that. You can have a complete sentence like I've been doing on all the other tasks. Um, this is completely opinion on my part. It just is useful for me. Uh, service is a module. This could have been a task. This, is, this exact thing could be a task, and it would just restart Apache every time. One second. So, so service is a module. You can look it up in the Ansible docs. Name is Apache 2. State is restarted. Uh, state could also be started, stopped, reloaded. I don't actually think Apache's init.dscript has reload, but I'm not totally sure. But, that would, but service is really just a uh, wrapper around the service you know, Unix command. So it's whatever the init.dscript understands. Yes? You would have to have that exact full sentence. Yeah. It, the, the lookup is by the text of the name. And that's, and that's actually the reason why I tend to use more variably things for handlers is precisely because I don't want to mess with like, oh, I forgot the period at the end or stuff like that. Again, entirely personal style. And I work for Ansible, and if you look at like our official playbooks for our internal stuff, like nobody else does it the way that I do it. Um, but I, I learned Ansible at my previous job before I went to work for them, and this is the style that we landed on there, and, and we liked it. But I'm not trying to be religious about it as much as just this is the way that works for me. Questions? Anyone else? So assuming that it's in a role, um, assuming that you're within a role, it would be in the handlers directory. So it would be in handlers slash main.yml. If you were just in your playbook.yaml file, remember how you have hosts, colon, all, and then tasks, and then a big list? You would have handlers and then that list. Great question. Thank you. Any more? Okay, moving on. Modules. It's 1121. I have till 1220. I am unfortunately going to burn through this pretty quickly. Um, and that is probably fine because it's the type of thing that you won't really be doing a lot of until you've been working with Ansible for a while. Um, although I'm a little bit sad that I'm burning through it quickly. So modules are the previous, the way of extending Ansible. There are about six, uh, well, actually, there's two ways, modules and plugins. Um, modules are, we've been using modules. User was a module. Apt was a module. Yum was a module. Service that you just saw was a module. Debug was a module. Uh, what else have we used? Been a couple others. Uh, Anita found synchronize, which is a module. Copy, template are modules. Um, you can write your own, believe it or not. Um, Ansible provides a lot of them. You can write your own. They go in the library directory um, of your role. That's also configurable via the Ansible library environment variable or using dash dash module dash path. Um, but they just need to be uh, mode executable. They execute on the remote machine and they return JSON. They can be written in any language, but really use Python because Ansible provides a lot of tools to make it much easier to write them in Python. But they don't technically have to be. Um, again, they re just return JSON. There's a few keys that have meaning when they're returned. Uh, obviously, the JSON key changed, which can be true or false. That controls whether you, you get the yellow or the green. It controls whether the handlers are notified, if you have notify, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing is you can return b optionally back a key called Ansible underscore facts. And then that would be a dictionary underneath that. Any keys and values you return there are added as variables and available for the remainder of the run, which is very powerful if you need it. Um, if you are writing a module, it is your job to make the module impotent. Uh, a few tips about writing modules. Uh, assuming that you're writing, in, writing them in Python, um, you'll want to 
import everything from ansible.modulesutil.basic. I really, really, really hate importing star ever. I really, really, really don't like doing it. Unfortunately, you really do need to. Uh, if you just r import Ansible module, it doesn't do things right. I don't understand why. I, I haven't looked at it that carefully, but I don't know why it does that, but you really do have to import star because reasons. Um, that will provide you with a class called Ansible module, which you instantiate to create your module. Um, it has a, a thing it takes called argument spec, which is a dictionary. Uh, and that lets you, so remember when we were doing user and we were sending name and state and system, uh, you specify your arguments in the argument spec. It's a dictionary. It's documented very well. Um, and then the module that you create, so the, you know, when you instantiate your Ansible module, I'm assuming you would assign it to a variable called module. It has uh, methods called exit JSON and fail JSON, which do exactly what you think they do, which is exit with a success or exit with a failure, um, including whatever stuff you have. Um, one of the things that's common in modules is writing a module that does things with files. The file arguments like owner, mode, group are all relatively common. And so there's this thing called add file common args equals true and ways of dealing with them. We are not going to go over there, those in detail because we really do not have time. Uh, know that they're there and they're in the documentation. We're skipping this exercise. Fastest one ever. Plugins. Plugins are the other key way of extending Ansible. Modules are for, you know, modules, once you create them, then they're available as tasks. You can reference that module exactly the way that you think. Plugins are, get into a couple of other spots within Ansible. There's six different types, action, callback, connection, filter, lookup, and bars. Say that five times fast. Um, several of those you really don't ever use in real life. We have never actually figured out a valid reason to make a bars plugin. Uh, you really want a custom inventory script. Um, so they're kind of there, but you don't ever do it. Uh, action plugins are extremely rare. Uh, connection plugins, you might need one if you have a really weird case, but probably not. That would be, if you don't want to connect via SSH, you want to connect via something else, and it's something else that we don't provide, you would write a connection plugin. Um, I have never encountered anyone who wanted to do that. Um, we provide several others other than SSH. We provide Paramico. We provide something for Windows. I don't remember what it's called. Uh, obviously, local. You saw me use connection local a second ago. But uh, the chances that you're going to write one are pretty slim. I work for Ansible, and I've never written one. Uh, filter plugins provide uh, Jinja filters. If you're familiar with filters in Jinja, uh, Ansible provides a ton. Um, but you can add more. They're very, very, very easy to write. If you've ever written a Django plugin, it's almost the exact, or a Django filter plugin, it's almost the exact same principle. Um, lookup and callback are probably the most interesting two types of plugins. Uh, and I have slides for those in a minute, so I'm going to hand wave them for now. Uh, plugins belong in the, uh, in the appropriate directory action plugins, callback underscore plugins, et cetera. Uh, see what I just did with the Jinja variable in there? Uh, and they go in the subdirectory of the plugins directory. They can go in a role, or they can go in whatever your Ansible plugins directory is. I think it's the Ansible plugins environment variable. Regardless, it defaults to user share Ansible plugins. Callback plugins. Callback plugins define a, uh, so plugins, unlike modules, must be in Python, as not. Callback plugins uh, define a class called callback module, I believe. Yeah, callback module. And that module has, or that class has to have about 50 to 60 methods. And they're all things like playbook on start, playbook on finish, playbook on fail, task on fail, that kind of stuff. Um, basically, there are a whole bunch of hooks where when various different things happen within Ansible, the plugin gets triggered. And some of them get triggered all the freaking time. Like, there's, there's ones for task successes, where every single task will trigger this plugin and let you do something. Um, they're really useful for things like logging. Uh, we include some callback plugins for, say, posting to Slack or to Hipmunk or to IRC. 
that kind of thing. That, those are the common reasons to do it. You might have something that says that if your playbook completes successfully to notify another server. Uh, one place where that gets used is companies that want to uh, do their rollout in shards. So say you have 100 servers, but you want to roll them out 10 at a time. So you do the first 10, and then when it finishes, you trigger to do the next 10, and so on and so forth. A callback plugin could potentially do something like that. Um, all the methods, unfortunately, must be defined uh, to have a valid plugin, which is just a big copy and paste job from one of the existing ones. Uh, I'm not giving you a list because it's massive. Uh, and I don't think it changes very often, but just in case, I don't want to put it on a slide. It's also huge. It would take like three slides. So if you ever need to write a callback plugin, get a list from the documentation. Lookup plugins are, remember we did iteration with with items earlier? There's actually quite a few of those that exist in Ansible. There's uh, with nested items, there's with dictionaries, there's with a file glob, there's several other things. But you can actually write your own. Lookup plugins execute on the local machine, and they're very, very, very simple to write. Um, they provide, you have a class named you know, lookup module, it needs to define a dunder init method um, with this method signature. Pretty much the only thing that it ever does is assign self.baster baster to self.baster. Um, this is one of those things where the first time you need to do it, you'll find it in the documentation immediately. And, it, and then it defines the important thing, which is run method. Uh, and the run method basically can do whatever it needs to do, and it returns a list. Um, and there's even no rule that it has to be local. For my previous company, I actually wrote a lookup plugin, and what it did was it integrated with our um, user management software that we had written to say, tell me what all of the like, employees in the company are. So, we could, so when we made SSH users for every employee, rather than having that checked into version control and having to change it all the time, we actually had a database out somewhere that had that information. And with feed magnet users would go and just send back a list of all of them um, so that anywhere that we wanted to use it, we just had this list you know, pre-made, and it went and got it off, off our API. Um, terms are the, the terms that are passed. So if you make a lookup plugin called foo, then it becomes available as with underscore foo colon, and then you put stuff there, like that, the list that you're writing to with items. Um, or sometimes it's a string. That's, that comes into the lookup plugin as the terms variable. Uh, inject you probably won't ever use in real life and then the star star quarks is future proofing. Um, it's really, really, really common uh, when you're writing a lookup plugin to immediately, when you uh, use your terms for the first time, to use this utils.listify lookup plugin terms. It basically takes whatever you got and makes it a list. So if you got a string, it'll make it a list with one, one item. Filter plugins makes Jinja 2 filters available to templates. The module defines a filter module class with filters methods. Takes no argument and returns the dictionary. Each item in the dictionary, the key is the filter, and the value is the method that runs when the filter is used. Um, you'll need, I've never had a reason to write a filter plugin, so I'm mostly saying this for completion, but you actually might need them. Uh, it's basically if you need it in a template. I recognize that I'm going over those things really, really, really fast. Um, and the reason I'm going over them really fast is because I want to start you guys on a project. Uh, I don't know that we'll be able to completely finish the project, but we'll at least be able to get uh, somewhat into it. And so I don't want to spend a bunch of time on modules and callback on modules and plugins because that's not something that most of you will be doing at least for a while. So that's the end of the exposition part of the presentation, which uh, an hour later, I will take questions and then I will give you guys a project. But please ask any questions that you like. Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Line and file. There's a module called line in file, L-I-N-E-I-N-F-I-L-E, -E, one word, uh, that, that does exactly that. It will look for a line based on regular expression and then put in the modification. If it doesn't find it, then it will add the line. Uh, and, and there's things in there for adding it before and after a particular spot and doing something like that. Um, 
Another useful module for configuration management in general is a symbol. A symbol is basically conf D for the conf D list. Uh, it will take a bunch of files that you wrote to the box and amalgamate them into a single file. It's really, really, really useful in a lot of cases for if you want to piecemeal configure a uh, config file, then you just write all the pieces. And, and that way, you have a lot of options later for just writing a new file into the thing or, or modifying it piecemeal and such. A symbol is great. Uh, those are the two primary ways. Line in file is the one for your specific question. A symbol. Yeah. It's one word, a symbol. Like, everyone is symbol in the narthex. Yes. Oh, I see. Yes, no, a symbol. A-S-S-E-M-B-L-E. -S -S -E. Yep, no, good question. OK, my lovely wife is about to hand out a project. I do not, I'm not convinced that you guys will have time to complete this project, and that's OK. But you can at least get started. I will come around and help. It's a little bit more non-trivial than the other exercises that I've given. And the project is to create a Minecraft server. Or, well, it's not to create a Minecraft server. That would be very large. To deploy a Minecraft server. Slightly more reasonable. Um, so what I have, can I actually get a copy of my own handout? Because I don't have one up. Oh. So demanding. Thank you. OK, so basically what this is is I've given you guys English example, so I, I went and did this uh, last week. That's what I got to do at work while I was preparing for this tutorial. All of my coworkers were very jealous. Um, I went through and figured out what all the steps were to provision a Minecraft server in a particular way. Um, and I've written them out in English in four steps. Um, the first step being install Java, and then the steps you need to do, so what you need to apt install, adding the PPA, accepting the EULA, and then installing Java. Uh, and then installing a server manager, I just picked one, which is EMSM. Um, again, installing the app packages, creating a system user, and then going through a couple of the things in the EMSM documentation. Um, and then what you have to do to set up particular worlds, uh, there's some steps for that. Minecraft is obviously very closed software, so you have to accept a EULA and do some other stuff. Um, I've written that down in English. And then uh, start the worlds. And then if you're really feeling like a glutton for punishment, installing mods is the last step. Sure. Actually, no, because it won't be readable. And you just handed it out to everybody. Oh, yeah, that's probably useful to get it to them. OK, I will do that in a moment. Um, so. Basically, OK, wonderful AV people. If you want to try to get that for people watching the tutorial later, feel free. I'll leave that up for a few minutes. Um, not, not easily. This is a pages document. Um, that, that's fine. They'll live. So, I will be, so if you would like to be done, then uh, thank you for coming. I would love to take any feedback. I will also take any questions if you want to start on this and see how far you can get. Um, but basically, at this point, we have reached the end of me talking up front in front of you guys, and I am now going to let you work. I, uh, quick, quick thing I will say is I do have a working example. At the end of this tutorial, so in about an hour, I'm going to post it. Um, it is a private GitHub repo right now. It will be a public one. Uh, it will be available at LukeSneringer slash Minecraft Playbook, and I will give you that at the end of the uh, hour. I'm not going to give it to you now so that people can't just blindly copy the entire thing. Yes? Pound Ansible is on Freenode, is the general Ansible users IRC channel. The core devs of Ansible do hang out in there during the workday, and I'm told they're pretty good at answering questions. You might not get answers quite as quickly from them because they're here. Uh, James and Toshi is already here, and James is flying in today. So you might get slightly slower answers right now, but generally they're pretty on the ball. And there's also 
several hundred other people that are in that IRC channel all the time answering questions. I do not hang out in there, but a lot of people do. There you go. I'm pretty sure there. I'm, I'm fairly certain that it takes all manner. I, I don't spend time in there, so I'm not entirely sure, but that's what, that's what they have told me to. Okay. Uh, you, can also, you can also email me. My email is on the first slide. I'll put it back up in a minute. At this point, I am happy to take questions. Uh, if you are done with me and want to bugger off, feel free. And also, I would be really interested if this is my first time doing a tutorial for PyCon or anywhere else for that matter. So if anybody has comments on what you think I did well or poorly, I would really love to hear them as well. <laughs> 